There are so many yeses to so many things that I could give in the name of God, but in the pursuit of greed. But I say no, because I want my heart to be soft. So if that means that I cannot have what other people have so that I am a woman of integrity, then that's what I'm gonna do. That's a cost. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Happy Hour. I'm Jamie Ivey, your host, and today on the show, Jackie Hill Perry is here. She's been a guest featured on a lot of times on The Happy Hour. We love having her here. Anyhow, she has a new devotional that's out. Uh, It's called Upon Waking, a 60-day devotional. Highly recommend. It's beautiful. Uh, In her words, she doesn't like fluffy or flowery devotionals, which I get it. And um, she wanted to create something that had a lot of depth to it, uh, but was the bite-sized piece that you could chew on in the morning and think about all day. And so she did that. I love when Jackie's on the show. Uh, We talked today about, believe it or not, we started off the show talking about makeup. Then we talk a lot about the conference that she put on Glory and how she saw God work through that. Uh, And then we talk about what it means to be a Bible teacher and the accountability that comes with that and, and everything that that entails. We talk about obedience, how it has a cost and I think I've been learning that a lot in the last couple of years. And Jackie and I talk about that. And then, of course, even though this is old news now, my friends, we talked about Big Brother because we both watched Big Brother and the finale was a couple of weeks ago. So you're going to love the show. Thank you so much, Jackie, for coming on. I want to remind you guys about a couple of things. Number one, if you are a YouTube watcher, uh, all of our episodes are up over on YouTube. In fact, if you're watching me right now, ha, you know it. Uh, but all of our episodes are over on YouTube, and it's really fun. You get to see the the entire content. You get to see the guests. And sometimes you just want to say to yourself, I want to watch this. I want to watch this instead of listen to it. So come find us over there. Go to YouTube and search up Jamie Ivy, and you will find us. Okay, here's a couple of things I want to remind you about. First of all, you've seen the announcement. You've heard me talk about it. My new book is called why can't i get it together kick unrealistic expectations to the curb and rest in god's truth here it is i'm showing you the cover for all my friends on youtube uh it comes out in february and you can pre-order it now go to jamieivy.com for all the information you guys this is the last episode in november that we are airing and so so we just had our book club conversation for november and it was happening earlier this week and we read the book uh the little liar by mitch album love this book so much if you go to um patreon.com slash the happy hour that's where we host our book club let me tell you about the book club a little bit it's ten dollars a month it gets you a digital copy of the book and then we have a conversation where we get to come over and listen to myself interview that author but i want to say this we're changing things up in january and so i just think just go over to the patreon page and join for free right now and then you'll be able to see the information as we change it I can't wait till this to 2024 because the book club is going to be awesome. Anyhow, our December book club, we just announced it recently, is by John Mark Comer, Practicing the Way, Be With Jesus, Become Like Him, Do As He Did. And this book actually comes out January 16th, but we have an early release. And so if you're a part of our book club, you can read it this month for December and then join uh, Mark and I for a conversation uh, in a couple of weeks. So anyhow, you guys, I'm glad you're here. Thanks so much for listening to this conversation with Jackie. And I hope that in this conversation that you have been just encouraged and, um, gosh, reminded of how how good God is. And I'm just grateful for you being here. Jackie, welcome back to the happy hour. Hi, Jamie Ivy. Hi. This will be your second time to be on this year of 2023. Can you believe that? Is it? Was that this year? It sure was this year. Remember, we recorded that episode that was the first episode of the year where you interviewed me. Oh, yeah. That was kind of and you to under, do that, by the way. Under ridiculous circumstances, because I was in a coffee shop trying to ask you questions. Oh, yeah, I don't I know why that. I didn't do it at home. I don't know why I didn't do that. It's okay. Yeah, you remember that I told you about my Botox? You did. And I told you about my bins. There you go. <laughs> so what? Hey, what will come out today, friends? That's just what I'm here. (laughs) You know, what's interesting, Jackie, is since that, I kind of let you into that a little bit was happening in my life then. And since then, like, man, I don't know if you can notice, I don't got my lashes done anymore. I gave my lashes Mm. a break for physical reasons. Like I needed to give a break. And I also was just feeling like, man, I just don't know if I need to be spending my time and my money in a lash chair every three weeks. But I do miss them. You know what? You've been talking about lashes. This is good. Yeah. This is good. Have you worn them? I wore them in the Dallas Glory and appropriate I have not worn in Dallas. Since. Yes, you hated it was, them. It was. I didn't hate them. I like what they, it did to my face. 
you know, it gives it gives this kind of like, oh, okay, girl, look to the face. Um, I wasn't a fan of just the feeling of them. Yeah. Like, and all the stipulations and the terms and conditions that come with them, because even I was told that you can't cry. And I'm like, I, that feels like bondage now. Like, uh-huh. I can't express <laughs> yeah. emotion because yeah. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> so I haven't, I don't know for what reason I'll wear them again, but it's not off the table. Oh, good. Well, I was doing them where I would go have them individually put on. So you could just live life and it was great. Um, That's a lot. I do miss them though, because they just make you look alive. You wake up and you're like, here I am. (laughs) Like, (laughs) let's go. (laughs) No, it does. It it changes, it changes the face, but I have uh, invested in just a better mascara. Yeah. That will like lengthen the lash I have better. So that, that helps. Well, th- this is a this is a side note. When you're on stage at Gloria, whatever you're doing, do you do your own makeup? Yes. You are very good. I'm getting good. You are. I'm I just get- in, I'm very impressed because I don't like makeup and I don't do a lot yeah. of makeup. Like mm-hmm. you look, your makeup looks great. I'm good. So the first two years I had an artist. And then this year I wanted to save money. So I just took it more serious. But I, I also, you know, you know, I can draw and paint and stuff. And oh, so I didn't know I, that about I, you. Yeah, I think that's a part of it is I just started to look at my face like a canvas. Like, how do you blend colors uh-huh. on a canvas? You just need to do that with your face. So I'm getting I'm getting there. Well, I'm all right. I just want to say I noticed and it looks good. <laughs> and, you know, the game changer, Jamie, a matte sp- setting spray. So oh, okay. I've always been hesitant to work with matte products because I wanted some type of glow and like mm-hmm. dewiness to my skin. But what the matte does is it blends and like it like blends and blurs the foundation where it looks smoother than it would have otherwise. And that completely changed. I said you would never think satin spray uh-huh. is really the game changer. So I do a dewy primer a dewy foundation and then a matte spray i just never knew that our conversation would go to this makeup talk i'm just so <laughs> impressed jackie <laughs> it kind of matters it's, it's, it's the aesthetics i like it i like it okay you've um been doing a lot and i i want to talk to you about two things uh you've had your mm-hmm. glory conferences and i want to i want to dive into that a little bit and then you released a devotional this fall con called Upon Waking, a 60-day devotional, uh, which is not only beautiful, and I know that it's important to you, uh, but it's rich. The content is rich and good. And so let's start with glory, all Mm. right? I don't know that we've ever had a conversation about why you wanted to do your own conference. Hmm. Why, Why did that start for you? Yeah. The practical reason was that was post- it was pre-pandemic when I was traveling all over the place. And I was like, I still want to be able to teach women the Bible without having to leave my home as much as I do. So I went to Lifeway to see if we could have an event, a partnership on an event that would allow me to teach and be at home. Um, And then the pandemic happened. So that conversation was paused for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was practical. Spiritual is, I really enjoy teaching scripture. But I also enjoy creating events and the experience of it. So it's like the music, the visuals, the the community, like the whole situation Mm -hmm. I wanted to do um, because I've been a part of a lot of conferences and I've been able to observe what people do well and what people do wrong. And I wanted to see if I could do it myself. And so we tried and I learned a lot from it. Well, you, you did try and you've been successful at it. And I think it's interesting for someone who travels and teaches scripture to say, I want to have a hand in all of it. I just want, I just don't want to show yeah. up one time. And I yeah. think even though you're not leading these women on a weekly basis, this isn't their church, all the things, there is a sense of, of you getting to pour into their lives a little bit deeper, even because you've been yeah. a part of everything that goes on. Have you felt that? For sure. Yeah. yeah. There's a... There's a different synergy, I guess, in the room because you kind of know me, you have context for me, um, you've done some work, whether that's with Holier Than Thou or with Gay mm-hmm. Girl, Good God. So you already have a framework for even my theology, right? That kind of like uh, prepares the way for you to receive from me um, in a real special way. And so, but also for me to introduce women to other women. So that was really mm. important for me too, like to 
to have Dr. Sarita Lyons join me, to have Jordan Welch, to have uh, Yana Connor, to have Sarah Bonibo, so that like it's always been a thing for me to 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 be generous with my platform. And so I, I rarely platform people who already have platforms. I usually platform people who are gifted and are doing work in the local church that need to be seen. And so that was cool too. That's really cool. Has that yeah. been, I was going to ask if that's been hard work. I think it does take a little bit more diligence though. Cause you're not just looking mm -hmm. to see who's on all the stages. Who can I bring with me? You're having mm -hmm. to do a little bit more diligence to find people who aren't so public. Well, I never find them. They just, I just come across them. And I, anytime I see someone who is either a teacher or has some wisdom or gifted in some way, I put it in my pocket for the time when I can partner with that person, if the Lord leads. And so everyone who I've worked with, I saw them and observed them in some way. And I put it in my pocket until the Lord was like, all right, they can mm -hmm. do this here mm -hmm. at this point, at this point in time. And so that's exciting for me. Um, that type of and stuff. Another thing that I think, I don't want to say sets your conference apart by any means, but it is a different world than I am accustomed to as a, as a mm -hmm. white woman growing up in the church mm -hmm. is that your platform is all black women. And, yeah. um, that's been intentional. Yeah. <laughs> because you, black women, we usually hold one or two spots at these conferences if we are theologically sound. Um, and so it felt important that we are visible throughout the entire thing, teaching, doing music, singing, uh, giving wisdom, all the things. Now, future events that I'm already planning, it'd be m much more diverse, but I wanted to make a point for glory. I love that was, it. That was that I had to do it for glory. <laughs> I love it so much. Is glory done and over? It is. You feel okay yeah. about it? I do. Good. I do. Because I, I have other things up my sleeve that will be be a fuller experience of the things that I see and want to do as it relates to Christian ministry. And, can you uh, talk events. about any of them? I can tell you offline. Okay, good. The, folks, <laughs> I'll get the word and I'll hold yeah. it in my pocket. Well, I'm excited yeah. about that because I've loved watching Glory unfold. And it's just like really cool to see you take this vision and watch it come to life. And yeah. really to see how God has used it to get women yes. in front of good teaching. I mean, what are some of the favorite things that have come from it for you? Ah, oh, so much, Jamie. I, I think I think on one end, it excites me for women to see that expository preaching is valuable because there are some spaces where expository preaching is not a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And you 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 can come with all these assumptions like it's going to sound like a lecture it's going to be boring, it's going to be whitewashed, like all the things. And it's like, no, this this is a style of preaching that draws out the meaning of the text mm -hmm. and applies it to our life in a way that honors the history and honors the author's intention. And so to me, to be able to display and walk through a passage with women, that that was important to see them open up their Bibles and mm -hmm. to see them circling and to see them taking notes like that, that is cool. But also, we had moments where one one young lady got up and was sharing about her, her struggle with infertility and she just started crying on the mic. And all these women got up that did not know her to hug her and pray mm -hmm. for her while she's weeping. So even mm -hmm. to see community being cr created live, mm -hmm. that's something, you know? That's and so cool. I just, I think the Lord is not done with using events. Like we need the local church. And so to me, that's one of my goals is how can we merge what we do in a event with local churches? I've, that's my next thing. But I think the Lord's hand is still on blessing stuff that's not associated with a pastor elder situation. I love it. You know, that expository preaching, I hadn't been really around that till I started going to church that I've been at for the past 15 years. And that's what we do is we just go line by line text. We'll go through the entire book of Matthew over like five years. Mm -hmm. And it really was like changed me, you know, because yes. you're not just coming in and you're like, okay, this next sermon series is all about lust. And for the next five weeks, we're talking about this, which is fine. Right. Yes. But I really love, there's a place for it. I really love knowing I sit in my local body every week and we're going through Hebrews and I don't know how long yeah. we'll be in Hebrews, but we'll be here forever. And yeah. I think you're right that we don't see a lot and this is not my gifting. So I'm like, I'm mm -hmm. owning that. We don't see a lot of that coming from women. No. 
And I don't know if it's because there's a couple of reasons. I'd love to get your opinion on this. I don't know if it's because for a long time, women haven't had the authority to be able to do that. Where would they do that? You know, or do women, do we, do we kick our own selves? Do we think we don't have the brains to do this? We, we shouldn't be doing this. What, mm-hmm. why, why is that? What's your opinion? I wonder if it's all of it. I, yeah. I do think there is a measure of insecurity that many people, but also women carry when it comes to the intellectual exercise of interpretation, like feeling like, I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know. Like, I'm not the pastor. I'm not on the elder team. Like, I didn't go to seminary. And so feeling like you don't have the makeup to do that kind of work, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's, it's our duty then to speak to the fact that, no, if you're an image bearer, at the very at the very fundamental level, you have the ability to reason. You have the ability to understand, right? Mm-hmm. Um, God has given you a mind to make sense of symbols and meanings and therefore words. But you also have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, then it means you have the capacity by his power to understand the word that he inspired. Um, I, so I think if we speak to both the way God has made us and the way God has empowered us, then that kind of lifts up some of those insecurities. But I also think another factor has to be that women are not included in many of the theological training spaces that men are. For example, um, I go to a seminary that I am enjoying, I am learning and all the things, but in the class that is about preaching and teaching, I could only go to the portion of the class that was about communication. I had to drop out of the class when it became about preaching, right? Which is interesting. So very interesting. I was thinking about how I have a lot of space to preach and hone my gift. I have a lot of connections, a lot of networks to become more of a homiletical practitioner, right? But I I was lamenting women who don't have those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So where do they go? How Mm -hmm. do they learn how to navigate a text? How do they learn how to understand context and teaching, right? And so you don't necessarily have to go to seminary to learn how to preach God's word, but what if you wanted to go to seminary to preach God's mm-hmm. word and that was excluded from you? Then what? what? Yeah. So I think all of that is a thing. <laughs> I think it is all a thing. And I, I think about it. I mean, I do think about it some, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that God's given me to, to teach his word. And um, I'll tell you this, Jackie, it's funny. I was telling you earlier, we're talking about school and you've been in seminary, like you just mentioned, I just started this semester and a lot of my thoughts this semester in class have been, dear God, how have I mis- misinterpreted the scripture? Mm. You know, like it's mm-hmm. it's put a deeper weight on me even of like, mm. man, this is a heavier weight as someone who's proclaiming to be a teacher than I had. Not that I hadn't thought about, but you know what I mean? It's just given me like a lot to think about. It's been very, mm. very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew this, but the number one thing I think I'm taking away from this semester is like, God's word, like these books were not written as a Bible. Obviously we know that, Mm -hmm. but also these words were written to specific people in a specific time, in a specific place that don't include you and I, I mean, that's, that's crazy. You know, like so many times we put these Bible verses on our own specific situations and it's not like God's word doesn't apply to us, obviously. Yeah. But Paul didn't write Corinthians to us, to the people who live in Atlanta and Austin. It's just crazy yeah. to think, you know what I mean? It's causing me to think a lot. Yeah, because it is literature. It's God-inspired literature, mm-hmm. but it is literature all the same. Therefore, it has genre, yeah. right? Therefore, it has yeah. style. Like, I remember yep. talking to a, a, a girl I walk with, and she was like, what if, like, why don't they just put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all together? Like, why do we need them separated? Yeah. And I was like, because John's aim is not necessarily Matthew's aim, and mm-hmm. Luke's aim is not necessarily mark's aim right like they all had a particular perspective even though they are communicating many of the same stories and so we don't want to undermine their perspective by Mm -hmm. like eliminating the distinctions between all four of them yeah yeah Yeah. so good okay jackie i want to move on you have a project that came out this fall called upon waking a 60-day devotional and so i want to start first of all is just you've written i mean you're, you're a teacher you put on conferences um preacher, uh, written amazing books. Um, one of my favorite books on holiness. Why a devotional? The publisher asked me if I would be open (laughs) to 
to writing a devotional and I pushed back uh, originally because as I say in the book, I don't like devotionals. They come across real fluffy and flowery and cute. And I don't like fluffy, flowery, cute content. Um, And so that became a part of the challenge for me, which was, well, why don't you write what you want to read? Why don't you write something that is succinct and, you know, limited by a 500 word count, but it has the depth that you think would benefit people if they like meditated on throughout their day. So that's why I wrote Mm -hmm. it is to write something that was heavy, but small and short. It is. And I think it's like, I think that's even one of the reasons it's taken off so much is because it is not light and fluffy and it is something that could cause you to meditate uh, throughout the day. I picked just a handful. You've got, um, you know, 60 days in here. I picked a handful that I wanted to talk with you about. The first one I want to talk to you about is we've been talking about this a little bit, even with talking about seriousness, but you talk about the seriousness of teaching and your mm. verses from second Timothy two fifteen. do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, <laughs> rightly handling the word of truth. And, um, I think I want to just hear from you personally, what does it look like for you? We talked about all the things you're doing, all the teaching. How do you keep yourself in like a way that you can stand before the Lord saying, I'm handling this teaching mm. well? Like, what does that, how, I, maybe I'm asking practically, what does it look like yeah. for Jackie to do that? I think it's doing due diligence with the text, considering all the things. So let's say for, uh, I had to, for glory, I did a sermon on Genesis 16 with Abraham and Hagar and Sarai. And that's a tough text to, to read, right. To understand. Mm-hmm. And so part of the due diligence is I'm already in a place of dependence before I even start the process of interpretation Um, because it's hard, (laughs) it's difficult. Um, You know, I don't understand what they were going through. I'm not them, I'm not not Moses. I didn't even write it, right? So I already need God. And so I never never go into a text confident, never. I go into a text feeling like, God, for me to understand this, I need you. And so I'm praying. Mm. I'm asking for his help, like, and then I'm reading over it, but I'm not just reading Genesis 16. I'm reading Genesis 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, to see all of the storyline that goes Mm -hmm. around that storyline. And then I'm reading through it, drawing out different observations, all the things. And I think, I think one way to guard yourself from mishandling scripture is not to assume that the first idea that comes to your mind that you that you think is an interpretive conclusion is the right conclusion, mm. you know, because it, it can come mm-hmm. up like, oh, well, mm-hmm. obviously Abraham is sending her back to submit to Sarai because she's pregnant. He's trying to save her life. Uh-huh. Damn. Point Sorry, number one. Teacher. God, yep. mm-hmm. God sentences her back because of da 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 da. Like you have to, you have to you have to not trust yourself that much, right? And mm. so I think that's one. And then considering commentary. What are the commentaries saying? What is the original language saying? What are all the things? And then considering the people. That's another way to rightly handle the text that we miss out on. It's like you can you can exegete a passage correctly, but not actually preach it in such a way that it honors the people that are listening. So mm. if I'm if I'm walking through a passage that's dealing with infertility, I'm not over here finna go in on Sarai as if infertility doesn't make you desperate, right? Mm -hmm. So I need Mm -hmm. to honor the women in the room who say, where it's like, you know what? I am sorry that you have been trying to have a baby. I am sorry that you have been praying. I am sorry that you have been fasting. I am sorry that you tried IVF and nothing works. And so let's look into this text to see how God's nature can even speak to your infertility. And that is what is missed out when a man does not consider women when they're teaching texts like that, is they completely skip past the infertility to get to the promise that Ishmael mm. and Isaac and I, the, all the 12 tribes are born and Jesus came out from them. Yippee, yay, yay. It's like, no, but speak to the woman in the room who yeah. cannot have a baby uh-huh. and she doesn't want to hear this text. Mm-hmm. That That's how you write the hand. I love it. You know, you say in that devotional, you said it's easier now to become a teacher than it was then. Then there are more people who will stand before the Holy One to hear a judgment they weren't prepared for. It says, you know, anyone can have, you know, a phone and a mouth and call yourself a teacher. What do we do as followers of Jesus to. Oh, how do I say this? 
we're not like tearing down people who are doing that. Like we don't, we're, that's not what we're doing. But like, maybe my question is better to say, someone's listening. Well, I'm a teacher. I got a phone. I go online. I'd be teaching. <laughs> what is the weight that that should carry? Like, it has to be more than just picking up your phone and putting an Instagram story out to call yourself like I'm a Bible teacher. Yeah, I've been reading through Jeremiah. And one thing that strikes me is how God talks about false prophets. And one of the things he says is that they prophesy the divination of their own minds. And he's going to see to it that they are judged for communicating ideas and putting God's name on it. And I think that has to bear some weight on us who even are attempting to preach the truth, which is that God cares about us saying things that influence people. Mm -hmm. He cares a lot about that, right? To the point that James is over here like, not many of y'all should even mm -hmm. do it. Why? Because you'll be judged more harshly. And mm -hmm. I think maybe because we're not being ordained or because we're not preaching in the local church or because we're not preaching in front of thousands of people, that it doesn't feel as weighty to make a truth claim to 5,000 followers. But that's 5,000 souls. Mm -hmm. That's 5,000 minds. That's 5,000 mm -hmm. families. That's 5,000 teachers who we are influencing. And there, and there there are implications to the way people live out their life by proxy of what they believe if what we're saying is true. And I think mm -hmm. that that weighs on me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it should make you cautious. It shouldn't make you that excited. It should make you feel like <laughs> um, privileged that God would call you to communicate truth in his word. But you you shouldn't be running to it like with all this glee mm -hmm. if you aren't tempered by the sobriety of the fact that God will judge me for what I teach. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that when you have fans and followers. Who are judging you good, mm -hmm. right? They're that, that's what a that's what a comment is. Mm -hmm. This was such a blessing. I mm -hmm. love this. I'm going to buy all your devotionals, right? That's a judgment, but it's not the final judgment. Mm -hmm. And so I I can't even base what I'm doing and how I'm communicating and how I'm living on what people say when even Jesus says, "Woe to you when all men speak well of you for for, for so your your people did the false prophets." Like there's mm -hmm. sometimes when, when everybody's recommending you, that might not be the best thing in the world to be receiving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like God's word and community is important. Having people in your life who are checking you um, yeah. and helping you like love people more than you love yourself. I love that so much. Okay. I got one more for you. This was about obedience and this actually uh, you, you start the whole devotional and you say, <laughs> Did you know that obedience comes with a cost? And um, you, you go on to say, I'll read the whole first paragraph. It says, this isn't news to anyone who's looked upon the lives of the faithful. One group in particular listed in Hebrews describes both the cost of obedience and the person that helps us continue in it. And you talk about mm -hmm. the cost of obedience. And I want to know, like, what does that look mm -hmm. like for you in your life, the cost of obedience? Because I think this is what I think sometimes is I think sometimes we're obedient to the Lord. And I have stories that I could tell you offline from my life in the past couple of years of like obedience has cost me things that nobody knows. And so again, mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to tell me the things that obedience has cost you that nobody knows. Obviously that's some of those things don't need to be said out loud, but I think sometimes people think that obedience shouldn't cost you. Like God's going to honor that. Like God's going to honor your obedience. So everything's going to be great. Mm -hmm. But I think often mm -hmm. obedience, it costs us something. Yeah, what does I that mean, look like for you? If obedience costs Jesus his life, then surely it's going <laughs> to it's going to cost me right. something in life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's cost me ease. I think my mm -hmm. life would be a bit more comfortable. Like inward if ease I or like ease with life? Both. Right. So practically how many things has god told you as a wife to do that would honor your husband but would cause you to actually take up your cross and die right even the way you communicate mm -hmm. be kind to him mm -hmm. don't share that just cast that care on me um you know 
be patient with him. There's some dying eternal. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to tell him, hey, you're wrong. You need to do this. You need to do that. So, so I even have to be patient in how I love him, which means that I have to surrender my own will to the Lord constantly. And that's yeah. just dealing with the husband. Mm-hmm. But then you have ministry stuff where the Lord is like, you know, I, I was telling this to somebody the other day. I'm like, there's so many things I could be, I'm going to be honest. I could be very wealthy if I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. There are so many yeses to so many things that I could give in the name of God, but in the pursuit of greed. But I say Ooh. no, because I want my heart to be soft. So if that means that I cannot have what other people have so that I am a woman of integrity, then that's what I'm going to do. That's a cost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like my, the Lord told me to take my kids out of school to homeschool them. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I like them going to school. I don't yeah. have to deal with them all throughout the mm-hmm. day. But the Lord is like, no, and I want you to teach them. That's a cost mm-hmm. <laughs> to obedience. And costly. it's costly in the fact that I'm banking on the fruit. Mm. Because even homeschooling ain't fruit that you like, okay, yeah, you know your math. Yeah, you know the things, but you could have learned that in school. So there's obviously right. some type of character development that God is trying to get out of this and me mm-hmm. being here that I won't even see until you're 20, maybe yep. 30, mm-hmm. maybe 40. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, it's even like this obedience that costs us even like assurance right now. I got to wait to see what God does. There's so many things. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes we in general people, we want something so fast. And so mm-hmm. like you're mentioning these things, the cost, sometimes there is no fruit till years later. And might I say, sometimes we will never see fruit. If yeah. you were to pass, speaking of your homeschooling, your kids, if you were to pass in five years, like there's a lot of things you wouldn't see, or even like all the things, uh, <laughs> what are you saying? True. Cause that's what the, the people in Hebrews he mm-hmm. goes on to say, like, they did all of that and they still didn't even see what mm. they were looking for. Like, yep. that's crazy. Yeah. But yeah. the motivation has to be the Lord. Mm-hmm. It has to be him. Like, because in all of this, I think though obedience is hard, I think what Jesus shows us is that it's worth it. It's worth it. Like, mm-hmm. it's like I, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth worth value Mm -hmm. of doing Christ Jesus. And so that's, we actually get something in something valuable in exchange for what we gave up, which is Mm -hmm. God himself. Yeah. I think the way I've been convicted about this particular subject, the most in the last couple of years has been talking to people and hearing stories of what it actually does physically cost believers around the world to be followers Uh of Jesus. And that is sobering for me. And Mm. so I think about like it may cost, like you said, it could cost you wealth or it could cost mm. you whatever else. And these are mm. real things that we're dealing yeah. with. And we have believers in North Korea who it they literally would die, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and it would cost them or it cost them their freedom. It costs. So that's always sobering to me. That's true. And that's convicting true. and all the things. Yeah. Um, Jackie, mm. I'm super proud of you for this book. It's Thanks. done so well. Can, can I ask you something that I don't, I think I saw you talk about on Instagram, but I want to ask you sure. how you're really feeling about it. Uh, we talked about, I saw you talk about the New York times. Mm. <laughs> I yeah. was trying to explain to someone cause they were like, well, if you've sold all these books, I don't understand why you wouldn't get on it. And so you can explain it real quick if you want. But what I really want to know is like, how does that feel for you? Frustrating. Okay. Yeah. So New York Times is obviously a publication. Um, They have a list, a bestseller list, and it it comes across as the bestseller list is completely objective, as in they are only listing people who have actually done the numbers to sell like 15,000 plus or whatever the case may be. But it's actually an editorial list, which means that you've done the numbers and they want you on their list which means that you can do the numbers and still be left off, which Mm -hmm. feels like a, I I told somebody, it feels like a publishing injustice Mm -hmm. Um, because my last two books should have been on the list, but it's not on the list, most likely because my first book was about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense where they don't want, because it's not even just me, you have uh, Gentle and Lowly, 
You know how many numbers Gentle and Lowly did? And it's was one of my favorite never, books, I know. And it never got it? Never. And that's because they didn't probably research the Ortlands and was like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is too much about Jesus. We don't want mm-hmm. this on. And so, so, which isn't to say that people, because Jenny's been on the list. So it isn't to say that mm-hmm. people who sure. make the list are heretics or false. It, it's not that. It's just saying that it's it's a, they're making a judgment call. Uh-huh. And so it, I feel like the Lord can, continues to use it to humble me because I would prefer, I think my flesh really wants that validation. Who wouldn't? That I mean, yeah. it's not like someone saying like, oh, you're so wrong, Jackie. I do see yeah. how God can use that to humble you. But it's also like, of course, like yeah. this is your job. This is what you yeah. wrote. This is what you're saying. Yeah. Hey, I'm putting this into the world. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, nope, not going to get it. Because if he wanted me to have it, he would allow them, like somebody mm-hmm. would quit and somebody that's like secretly a Christian be like, no, she did it. I was like, mm-hmm. but the Lord is like, no, I validate you. It's like, oh, okay. All right. Okay, I'll take it. All right. I'm trying, God. So, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, okay, before we go, this show's coming out the end of November, and November 9th is the Big Brother finale. So, this will be old, old news by the time this show comes out. But are okay. you up to date with Big Brother? Yeah, I watched uh, the last episode this morning. Okay, so we're up to date. We've got five uh-huh. people left. Who do you want to win out of these five? Want? Well, Ceri's about to yeah, go. Yeah, I'm going to so ask I, you who you want and who will. I would have preferred Ceri. Um, and then part of me, I don't, Fel- Felicia does things that bother me. Like she moves in, in some weird ways. But part of me wants her to win just because they've never had a person of her age oh, yeah. win this game. Uh-huh. And I feel like she's worked because she, she's won competitions, won. And she is actually very persuasive. She's working the game, like the social yeah. game of like, yeah, uh-huh. But clearly Jag is going to win. Mm-hmm. So, and Bowie Jane, I just don't even know why she's there. But <laughs> I'm just so frustrated. that Because I think that I think they're shooting themselves in the foot by bringing her to the final three. Because what they, I don't know if they know that the girl is a CrossFitter. She does CrossFit. They don't, they don't know. They think she's like a DJ. That's it. Mm. No, so she could she could very well beat both of y'all and be sitting in them final seats, Jag. Yep. Mm-hmm. But I also think she's a people pleaser, and so mm-hmm. I don't think that she will make the hard decision that will guarantee her a win. It's such an interesting show, and this is like I think I've done this one other time where I've been like I'm faithful. Like I tell Aaron all the time, if I fail seminary, it's because I gave Big Brother 178 <laughs> hours of my life this semester because we will catch up and binge, and I'm here yeah. for it. Um, but it's such an interesting show because you just see how easily people are swayed, and it is just like you're like, wait, you guys were best friends yesterday, and you're so easily swayed to go against your friend. It's an interesting. Like, I'm sure that's why you love it. It's an interesting case on humanity okay. of what it looks like. Go. I'm back. Okay. I was okay. saying, like, it's an interesting case about humanity of how you're best friends with someone one day and the next day you're willing to just throw them off the whole yeah. boat. And it's so interesting. I just saw, um, it was something, because I, I have a secret Twitter account just to follow Big Brother hashtag. Okay. <laughs> just, to, just for that. Uh-huh. And yeah. one of the old uh, Big Brother players were saying that they pay for them to get therapy once they leave. Oh, like well they that get a, they makes get a, me feel good. Yeah, yeah. And but I I thought about it. I was like, you have to think you're in you're in this place for ninety days when everybody is lying to you, but y'all are also a family at the same time because you can't read books. Only thing you can read is the Bible. You can't watch TV. You can't listen to music unless you're the HOH. Like, so you have no choice but the bond, but then y'all lying back to that. that. That would play with my mind. I know. I know. Because they're all friends. They all hug each other. And like, no one, no one so far, I don't feel like has left and been like, you know, F you all. And I hate you all and all the things like they do. They create relationships. Um, very, very interesting. I do have a question. Do you know what they do in the Big Brother when they go to the house afterwards? So what is her name? Janelle. She she was on Big Brother like three times. She's like one of the best players ever. She said the jury house feels like jail because you can't watch nothing because they don't want you to be influenced by anything. And so they you have movies that they give you to watch, but you can't text. You can't call people. She said it's a really terrible experience. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's not fun. At least Corey and America have each other. 
They do have each other. I yeah. hope he has that much. Um, well, in the Jackie, trash. it's always a joy and a pleasure to talk to you and have you on the happy hour. Uh, congrats on fin- congrats on finishing Glory Well and on your devotional upon waking. And I can't wait to see what's ahead for you. Thank you, Mrs. Ivy. Thank you. Hey friends, I hope you love this conversation as much as I did. To make sure that you never miss any of the happy hour conversations, go ahead and hit the subscribe button below to make sure you're notified every time we release a new episode. And if you want more content today, click on those videos over there. I think you're going to like them just as much as you like the one today.